schedule for the next couple weeks. Um, so no class on Friday. So we'll do acid base reaction to pH. We'll talk about that a little bit on Wednesday. I don't know what our lab's going to look like this week because I might have to adjust it a little bit, but we'll have something for this week. Nissa? I don't typically need to. The question is, do I curve the midterm? And the answer is not usually. I haven't had to in a number of years. If the class average is all below a certain point, if the median of the class is like 75, I'll probably curve it a few points because I like the median to be median and the average to be right around 80%. Um, if it's significantly below that, then I have curved it in the past. Um, but typically what you get is what you get. And there's not a whole lot of chance to like make up, you know, correct your answers and turn it back in. If I have to curve it, that's probably how I will curve it is everybody gets a chance to correct their test and turn it back in for a third of the points. Um, but again, that shouldn't matter because like I said, the tests are really easy to plan for and the averages are usually between 82 and 85. So it's a, it's a place that you can plan for it. You should be able to do pretty well. All right. My other, I suppose, out. hang on one second. <laughs> Get slides going here. All right. So, a couple questions. I have not gone through all the quiz questions yet, but the, I looked. I looked at the first ten or so, and there was some common themes. Um, about reaction types. So we're going to start by talking about reaction types a little bit. Um, just when it comes to um, a random question, somebody asked about what's, what's the deal with the molecular structures that are all just lines and hexagons. Um, that's basically just an abbreviated way of drawing Lewis dot structures. Um, if you have a compound that is drawn like this, every time a line ends is a carbon, and the way we do Lewis dot structures in organic chemistry is you assume that every carbon has four bonds unless it has a charge drawn on it. Because when carbon has um, four bonds, it has a formal charge of zero. So the most stable carbons are when you have four bonds. And so what we do in organic chemistry is rather than show all four bonds every time, we just assume, okay, everybody knows how to count to four. If there's only two bonds drawn for this carbon, that means it also has two hydrogens attached to it as well to make up the difference. So a lot of times this is a Lewis dot structure. It's a form of drawing a Lewis dot structure. It's just making different initial assumptions because we're using it for a different type of chemistry. Um, but it all has its roots in, in um, Lewis dot structures as well in formal charge. We just kind of have an abbreviated way of doing it. Um, so the other questions that I saw in the first few were, if you have three, three reactants and only one product, or if you have multiple products and you don't know what's oxidized and what's reduced, you're going to go back to those oxidation states that we practice, right? Where you assume, okay, the most electronegative element in this compound gets to fill its valence first. And you kind of work backwards from there. You guys remember doing that so that we could assign a charge even for covalent compounds? That's how, going to be how we figure out what's oxidized and what's reduced, and if it's a redox reaction. So there are a couple, there are lots of forms of redox reactions. The two that we specifically are calling out in this class are metal redox and combustion reactions. There are other types of redox reactions that are neither of these. But for the sake of these, this class, these are the two most common types. If it's a metal redox, that means you've got a metal ion or a metal atom changing charge in the course of your reaction. So copper metal going to copper one or iron, iron three going to iron metal. Anytime you've got a metal 
changing charge or changing oxidation state, we're gonna call that a metal redox reaction. Um, the other one is a combustion reaction. And combustion reactions were our example of like, well, how do you know how what's being oxidized or reduced if it's if nothing has a metal in it, nothing has a charge? Um, and that's how we use that that example. But just a reminder, a, a combustion reaction for this class is anything that starts as some carbons and some hydrogens, maybe some oxygens plus O2. So anything that's carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, if it reacts with O2 and makes CO2 and water, that's always a combustion reaction. So these ones should be like the easiest to recognize because you make CO2 and water every time. The only thing that changes is the balancing, right? But it's always gonna be plus oxygen, makes CO2 and water. And we can go through and we can track what's oxidized and what's reduced by doing those oxidation states. But again, for the purpose of the test, especially, learn the quick one, the quick reaction types to recognize, because as soon as you see CO2 and water, your first thought should be combustion. Unless there's something real weird going on, it's going to be a combustion reaction. Um, so why, and that I kind of already answered, why do we use those hypothetical charges, those oxidation states? Um, because even if we don't have a full charge changing, we can kind of, can the amount of electron density around different atoms can change based on um, where the most electronegative elements are. So even though carbon here has one charge and carbon here, or both of these are covalent compounds, we can give them those imaginary charges for the sake of saying, well, yeah, but it lost a whole bunch of electron density, even though it still has um, a full valence, right? So that's what those oxidation states, that's why they, they give us a way of determining whether it's a redox reaction or not. Um, and then the last one that I, the last few that I looked at all kind of said something about, well, how, I don't get complexation reactions, or I don't get how to determine if it's this or that. Um, basically, just remember that out of all of our reactions, it's either a redox reaction or it's not. And the one, if it's not a redox, we call that a complexation because we're just changing how things are attached together. We're not really changing any charges. So as soon as you can look at it and say, well, nothing's changing oxidation state or I can recognize all the same pieces on both sides, um, then it's gonna be complexation reaction. As soon as you can see something changed charge, a specific atom changed charge or changed oxidation state, it's redox. And then within redox, we had metal redox, combustion, and other. I know it's a redox reaction because the oxidation state's changed, but it's not a metal redox and it's not a combustion. What do I do with that? It's still a redox reaction. We just don't have a classification other than put it in the miscellaneous category for now. And then out of the complexation reactions, if it's not a redox reaction, for now, it's either going to be acid base or it's going to be precipitation. Right, and so acid base was the one we identified by saying it lost an H plus, something lost an H plus, something else gained an H plus. Um, and a precipitation was when, and we're gonna, that's what we're gonna spend bulk of our time on today. Um, precipitation reactions, anytime you mix two ionic solutions together and you make some, a solid out of it. You make a certain combination of ions that are in solution together. When they bump into each other, they stick together. They don't stay dissolved anymore. And then if that happens, you make a precipitate or a solid. Yes, sir? This is one of the reasons I don't like single and double displacement reactions is because 
double displacement reaction. The classic one is its precipitation reaction, but it also could be a form of a redox reaction. It's just another way of categorizing. For me and for this class, the way I want you thinking about reactions is it's either redox or it's not. Um, double displacement reaction, I'll, I'll explain kind of how that applies, but basically I don't, I don't like that because it's not describing what's actually happening very well. And there's, there's a disconnect between different textbooks, what constitutes a double re replacement and what doesn't. So since it's inconsistent, I figured I'd teach it the most consistent way. Any other question on reaction types right now? I know that the, the quiz kind of like threw, threw it at you and just asked you to sort of work your way through it. But just remember to think about it like this. If, if it's, it's either redox or it's not. And then within each of those categories, we have a couple of options. But other is, all, is definitely a category for complexation as well. There's other, this is not a comprehensive list of reactions. This is a good place to start. All right. So let's say we do some practice with sort of geometry and balancing and limiting reactants. I told you we were going to keep doing practice with these. This one doesn't give you the reaction, though. So start by writing out the reaction. Potassium chloride is added to barium nitrate. And you make solid barium chloride. Just start by trying to write this reaction out. It is helpful. So if I gave you this question on the test, it would be a pretty minor deduction if you didn't write the states of matter probably be a deduction, but it helps figuring out what type of reaction it is. You can see that it's aqueous plus aqueous goes to a solid. No, nope, that's what today's about. When we're talking about precipitation. So for now, but if I just, if I tell you this precipitates out, you should be able to fill it in, right? While you're getting started on that, I'm gonna hook up the nicer webcam for the sake of recording this better. Yes, but if you don't if it doesn't make a solid product, then they're just gonna be left in the aqueous state. Yeah. And again, that's part of what today's practice is about. So we'll get more practice with that. Potassium chloride, aqueous, plus barium nitrate. What's the charge on barium? Two, so what's the formula for barium nitrate? What's the charge on nitrate? Minus one. So if the barium's plus two and the nitrate's minus one, how many nitrates do I need? One of the reasons that we spend spend some time getting those polyatomics down, right? So we can get the right formulas. And this is going to make barium chloride as a solid. And for these precipitation reactions, whatever else is there, if we still have the the potassium and the nitrate, they just don't form a solid when you mix these together. So they're still floating around in the solution. So we just make potassium nitrate aqueous. Yeah. So now we need to balance it. Once we have it written out, we're gonna wanna balance it. Oh, sorry, the two on barium chloride. Thank you. 
So regardless of whether or not you recognize this as a precipitation reaction, one of the ways we can tell right away looking at it that it's not a redox is that all of our individual pieces have the same charge before and after. Fluoride is a minus one here. It's still minus one over there. Barium has a plus two here. It's still a plus two over there. Nitrate is a nitrate here. It's still nitrate there. Right, nothing changed charges. We just sort of re we rearranged what was where, what was attached with what. So at the very least, we would look at this and say, what's well, not a redox reaction? If we're trying to balance this, you can start kind of anywhere you want. We're making a product with two chlorides in it, right? So right off the bat, we know we're gonna need two potassium chlorides. Because if we're making barium chloride, we know that barium chloride has to be BaCl2 because barium has a plus two charge. So if we're making BaCl2, we need two Cl's. And then that gives us two potassiums, which means we're gonna need to throw a two there. I believe takes care of everything, doesn't it? A tip for balancing, for polyatomics, if you have the same polyatomics on both sides, then you can treat them like they're one thing to balance. You can just say, I have two nitrates here and two nitrates here. You don't need to do nitrogen and oxygen separately unless you've got a polyatomic, if you've got, if we were also making plus nitrogen gas or something like that, if we have another thing that has nitrogen or oxygen in it, that's not nitrate, then all of a sudden we need to do them separately, balance your nitrogens and oxygen separately. But as long as the only place nitrogen and oxygen show up are as a nitrate in both sides, we can just balance it as nitrates. All right, so we're balanced. Now that it's we have this written out in balance, we could fill in what we have to work with. 25 mils of KCl with a percent with a concentration. Is it 1.20? And 15 milliliters at 0.9. This is some more work with concentrations, right? Like we were working out last Friday. Just a, one more way to get to moles, right? Use those concentrations. Did I do something wrong, Simone? Okay. When in doubt, get everything in moles, right? 25 milliliters. This is moles per liter. So we want everything in liters. That's going to allow us to say, okay, well, for every 1,000 milliliters, it's one liter. And for every one liter of our KCL solution, it's 1.20 moles of KCL. So if we're writing this out more completely for a concentration unit, capital M means moles for every liter of solution, which means that's a conversion we can use. All right, so take our starting solution, put it in liters, then for every one liter is 1.20 moles. And then we're gonna do the same exact thing for the barium nitrate. 
And what do we get as an answer for moles for the potassium chloride? And how many sig figs do we want to keep? Three there and three there, right? So keep three sig figs. So was it exactly 0 0.03? Then add two zeros. One five hundred. Yeah, so point. What do we get? One three five. A small note about showing your work for these. For this one, we're dividing by a thousand and then to get liters, and then liters cancels out with liters here. Anytime you got one to one here, we can actually kind of combine these together to make to do it in one step if you want. If you're if you're strong on your conversions, because we can say 10 to the third milliliters equals one liter, and one liter equals 0 0.90 moles. So we can just say a thousand milliliters equals 0.9 moles and kind of rewrite this a little bit more compact if you feel comfortable doing that. If not, write it as two separate steps. But writing it like this, mathematically is the same thing, right? I just condensed two conversions into one. All right. So where do we go from there? Yeah. Trying to find theoretical yield and also trying to figure out limiting reactant. It doesn't say anything about excess reactant, right? We don't care what's left over. So this is a good case of we can take both of these figure out how much solid product we should be able to make and whichever number is smaller is gonna tell you what the limiting reactant is. Can we look at these and tell just off the top of our head once we're in moles, what's gonna run out first? Why Noah? Or how? Do you just do? There you go. Because we're using the KCL up twice as fast, because it's a two to one ratio, we need twice as much potassium chloride as we do barium nitrate. We have more than twice as much, right? Which means this is gonna run out first, right? If you're going to show your work for that, you still wanna show it as a conversion. Um, or at the very least, if you're doing that in your head, Showing your work can be, it's a two to one ratio, therefore you need twice as much. So I know, therefore, barium nitrate runs out first. You can explain it by writing a short sentence as a way of showing your work if it's a simple two to one ratio and you can do that in your head. Either way, you gotta get it to moles before you can do that, right? If we said, okay, if I'm gonna use up all my 0.135 moles of barium nitrate, 
and for every one mole of barium nitrate, that's one mole of the solid product of so barium chloride formed. The one to one ratio. If we if we thought if you looked at this and you guessed wrong and said I think this is going to run out first, we could do the same thing. Zero point zero three zero zero moles of KCl, and for every two moles KCl is one mole of product. get 0 0.015 moles as your theoretical yield if you do that, right? Versus 0 0.0135. They can't both be true, right? We can't have a theoretical yield that's 0 0.015 and a theoretical yield that's 0 0.0135. So if we're trying to decide between these, go back to your food analogy. If you have if you have enough pizza sauce to make three pizzas and you have enough cheese to make five pizzas, how many pizzas can you make? Three. Whatever the smaller number is that comes out of this is the correct theoretical yield. What I I'm going to explain it in a way that seems kind of funny and counterintuitive and silly, um, but I'm only going to explain it this way because I've seen it done this way before and I want you to avoid that. If you have enough pizza sauce to make three pizzas and you have enough cheese to make five pizzas, you can't make eight pizzas, can you? You're not gonna add these together. And when you put it in food terms, it's really obvious, no. Of course you don't make eight pizzas from three, you know, if you have sauce for three pizzas and cheese for five pizzas. But for whatever reason, people trying to show theoretical yield sometimes will take both of these numbers and add them together. That's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. All right, so the smaller amount tells you what the true theoretical yield is. How do we feel about the next step? Are we done with theoretical yield? I mean, technically the way it's written, if it doesn't say calculate theoretical yield in grams, technically this is the theoretical yield. So this answers part three, just by leaving it like this. But since the next step gives us grams and asks for percent yield, we either have to take those grams and turn them into moles, or we have to take the moles of the theoretical and turn it into grams. One way or another, we have to do a molecular weight calculation, right? So pick whichever way you want. 0 0.0135 moles, barium chloride. No, if you did the extra work, if I just said, what's the theoretical yield? Usually on the test, I'll make a point of saying what units to put it in. But if on the test, if I just said calculate theoretical yield and you left it in moles, or if you put it in grams, either way is a full credit answer. What's the molecular weight for barium chloride? 208.2. So what's our theoretical yield in grams? All right, you feeling good about these? So what's the percent yield? 0.0135. 
what you actually got divided by what you should have gotten or what you could have gotten. Grammatically, that sounds wrong to say, so I'm not sure I'm phrasing that properly, but the possible yield or the actual yield divided by the possible yield times 100. So it's going to be what, 87. 0.2% yield. We all feeling better about stoichiometry questions at this point. Like regardless of what the reaction type is, the stoichiometry doesn't care if it's a redox or not, right? Doesn't really matter when it comes to, to calculating the theoretical yield or limiting reactant. But we'll keep practicing with these so that everybody feels really confident about the stoichiometry part, even if you're shaky on classification or you know, completing these reactions on your own. <laughs> All right. There was one more good question that I got to in the first 10 answers on the quiz. Who discovered that the electrons aren't shared evenly? And, and that compounds make odd shapes. This was a perfect question because not only does it give me a chance to talk about one of my favorite chemists of all time, um, this guy here with the cat on the shoulder, um, his, name, his name is Linus Pauling. Um, I believe this is actually for a Rolling Stone interview. Um, you know that the guy is an awesome chemist when being a chemist gets you on the cover of Rolling Stone. Um, he was on the cover. He was one of the, he's one of those few people that won two Nobel Prizes, and he's one of only two people that won two, a Nobel Prize in two different areas. So Marie Curie got a Nobel Prize in physics for discovering radiation and a Nobel Prize in chemistry for discovering elements. Linus Pauling got a Nobel Prize in chemistry for the stuff we're going to talk about today, but he also got a Nobel Peace Prize because he was a very, very strong advocate for denuclearization in the 60s and spoke out against the US's policies when it came to third world countries and you know setting up dictatorships and things like that. Um, technically, he got his Nobel Peace Prize for his work on nuclear disarmament, but he was a very, very big, um, you know, almost the definition of what in the 60s the, uh, the conservatives would have called a peacenik, um, which is basically a pacifist. Um, and to make him even cooler, he lived most of his adult life, um, or after he retired, he retired from chemistry um, and lived in Big Sur. Um, and at the same time period when like all of the folk rock stars from the 60s were all living, like recording albums in Big Sur and living in Big Sur while they wrote their next album and stuff like that. So he got to hang out with Neil Young and you know all the people that Neil Young um, wrote songs with and, you know, Joni Mitchell and all that. Um, he was in Big Sur at the same time that they all lived there. So he got to hang out with them because he moved in the same circles. Um, anyway, really cool guy. I think we got so lucky. He is not, he died in 96, 94, one of the two. I just saw it today on his Wikipedia page. Um, in fact, he was such a big advocate for uh, nuclear disarmament and big critic of the U.S. government in the 50s that he actually is one of the first people that was targeted by McCarthyism. Any of you have taken AP U.S. or U.S. history yet and learned about McCarthyism? Um, basically, if they didn't like you, they just called you a communist and then that got you blacklisted from whatever industry you were in. He was one of the, one of the first examples of that because he got his passport confiscated um, in, the, in like 1952. He was supposed to go on a trip to a conference in London about the structure of DNA that Watson and Crick and Rosalind Franklin were speaking at and presenting their data. And he wasn't able to go because he had his passport confiscated. So there are people that say that he likely would have been the one instead of Watson and Crick who got credit for discovering the double helix of DNA um, had he been able to go to that conference and seen Rosalind Franklin's data firsthand. Um, but because they didn't have email back then and he wasn't able to go, he didn't get a chance to look at that data and form his own opinions, um, which is, yeah, it's just interesting piece of scientific history. Um, 
one more thing about him just because he fascinates me. He also was a bit of a kook in his, later in his life. He got what's called Nobel disease. And Nobel disease is when a Nobel Prize winner starts talking about area starts talking about issues that are beyond the area of their expertise that they're not qualified to speak on. Um, so he is actually one of the reasons that emergency the, as a product, like the super doses of vitamin C to ward off a cold, that came from him. Um, he was not at all qualified to say that. And it's been, it's been shown numerous times that taking mega doses of vitamin C when you get a cold is not going to stop you from getting that cold. Um, but that all comes from Linus Pauling originally, um, and probably one of the negative thing, effects he had on, you know, ideas about nutrition. Love all right. Let's so, what exactly did he do? Well, let's let's review a little bit of, of quantum, a little bit of talking about quantum numbers. So if you guys remember talking about quantum numbers, we talked about how there's the principal quantum level, which is your overall energy level. And then there's what type of orbital you're in. And then there's, are you spin up or spin down? Or are, which direction are you pointed within that orbital, right? All of those different quantum numbers are what make up an atomic orbital. Right, so, but if you, one of the issues that we had is, so, so Linus Pauling is one of the people that first suggested the idea that, um, chemical covalent bonds happen when half filled orbitals overlap with each other. But the problem is if you look at something like carbon, we look at the Lewis or the um, molecular or, or atomic orbitals, we have the 1s, then the 2s, then the 2p for a carbon, right? And if we fill in from the bottom up, we get this for the electron configuration for carbon, right? Look familiar? If that's the case, and covalent bonds only happen when you have half-filled orbitals that can overlap with each other, how many bonds should carbon be able to fill, form according to this? I mean, depending on what you do with it, maybe, maybe three if something was donating a whole pair of electrons, but for to be a co covalent bond, it should only be able to form two covalent bonds because it has two half-filled orbitals, right? but they already knew carbon actually makes four bonds. So what Linus Pauling was able to do is he was able to kind of reconcile these ideas um, and basically came up with the idea of what's called hybridization. And hybridization means that you don't really, when you start forming covalent bonds, you don't really have a 2S and a 2P anymore. You kind of have the ability to take these functions and mix them together to make sort of a weighted average of the different types of functions. Because remember, each of these lines represents a different mathematical function, right? If you had two, a function f and function g, you could add f plus g, right? And get a new function that would be, we'll call it h, would be f plus g equals h. Basically, what Linus Pauling did says, well, if this is a function, all four of these lines are functions, we can mix them together by just saying, okay, well, I'm going to take 25% of an S orbital and 25% of this P orbital and 25% of this P orbital and 25% of this P orbital and just add them all together. Take them all, multiply by 0.25 and add up the results. And what, that, what happens if you do that so here's a picture explaining what our original ideas would have predicted. Like, okay, we can only make two bonds with carbon, like we just said, right? Linus Pauling's idea was basically said, okay, well, if we have a P orbital and an S orbital, we can mix them together to get four orbitals that are all the same energy that look like a mixture of S orbital and P orbital together. Right, and so literally what he did was, was mathematically was take each of these functions, multiply by 0.25 and add them together. And you get four different orbitals out of it. And what's interesting about that is when you add up all the constructive interference and the destructive interference, it, you actually wind up with four orbitals where instead of, remember how P orbital 
everything was 90 degrees from everything else. It was the figure eights that were all perpendicular to each other. Turns out if you make, if you mix them all together, it automatically arranges itself in a tetrahedral shape. If you add up all the constructive interference and destructive interference, they're 109.5 degrees from each other instead of being 90 degrees from each other. So this also kind of explains how Vesper geometries work. Like it's not perfect because Vesper geometries, we saw that, oh, lone pairs are bigger than, than bonds are, right? Or take up more space. So those angles change a little bit. But this shows mathematically why Vesper geometries are able to spread out the way they are, push each other away the way they are, and explain why carbon can make four bonds. Because you don't actually have carbon making bonds with its 2p orbital. You have carbon making bonds with sp3 orbitals. Great question. Question is, does, it, does hybridization only happen with covalent bonds? And the answer is mostly. But basically, as soon as you get any orbitals close to any other orbitals, they don't stay in their 2s shape or their 2p shape anymore. As soon as you bring two atoms close to each other, they start interacting with the other orbitals and you wind up with things that don't look like atomic orbitals anymore. They look like these combination of orbitals. So would the SP orbitals be like, if, if the other orbitals were still, were, were still there, would they be like in between the two or would they be overlapping? So when you take these and you average them out, we can't just make energy out of nothing. So our hybridized orbitals, if we had 2s and 2p, our, S, our sp3 orbitals from mixing them together, are going to be in between the two energies. And really, it winds up being like, OK, well, they're 3 quarters of the way to the p orbital energy and 1 quarter of the way dropped down because you mixed 3 p orbitals together with 1 s orbital. So right, so you wind up taking the average of all four energies as well as the average of all four um, functions when it comes to the shape. So if you had more of the lower orbitals, the lower. So if you had more of the lower orbitals, they'd be able to go lower. So this is why this happens. The reason that this happens, the reason anything happens is because it makes things more stable, generally speaking, right? This makes things more stable because it allows the carbon to make four bonds instead of just being able to make two. And it brings down the energy of the p orbitals slightly as well. So each of those orbitals that it now has so we had this arrangement. Now we have all of them at the same energy, half filled. So that allows us to make more bonds. Bonds are stable. So this is a energetically favorable thing to do, which is why we see them behaving like this. When you give carbon the opportunity to make covalent bonds, it will spontaneously do this. And it's not even something, it's not like an action. It's not like you're physically mixing these orbitals together. It's just a place to put the electrons in a way to arrange the electrons that is lower in energy and creates more bonds. So it happens on its own spontaneously. Yeah, so one of the reasons that carbon makes such strong bonds is because it can make four covalent bonds and they're really close to the nucleus of the carbon. It has that low, that really high ionization energy. So this allows us to take those valence electrons and keep them close to the carbon, the carbon valence or the carbon nucleus rather, um, and also make four bonds when we do it. All right, so why does this matter? Why do we need to talk about this? Well, part of it is just that it helps explain Vesper geometries. Um, and part of it is it, this, it helps explain why certain bond angles occur and how things react. It winds up being really important when you get to OCHEM. Um, but in general, what we're going to do is instead of just referring to a carbon that has four clouds of electrons around it, we could call that a tetrahedral carbon. But another way of saying that, that's like a one-to-one -one analogy is to call that an sp3 carbon. 
So if something has a tetrahedral electron geometry, that's the exact same thing as saying it's an sp3 atom. Right, so the hybridization gives us the electron geometry. They're tied together. This is why the electron geometries happen the way they are. The easiest way to explain the electron geometries is to say, oh, electrons push away other electrons. This is the mechanism by which it works. This is how they actually get those other shapes other than just atomic orbitals. And so this next slide is sort of just showing, okay, here's here's the 2s orbital, 2p, 2p a, 2px, 2py, 2pc. Remember, they go along the, the uh, axis, the x, y, and z axis. If you add them up together, you get these sp3 orbitals that don't look like a figure eight truly anymore. I guess they kind of do. They're kind of like a skewed figure eight where one half of it's bigger than the other. So it looks something like this. Instead of being a nice, neat, symmetrical figure eight, like a p orbital, they wind up looking kind of like this. Because when you mix that s orbital and you get constructive interference on one side of the p orbital and destructive interference on the other side of the p orbital, so they kind of cancel each other out and you get this shape instead. Um, and so this is just showing geometrically how those shapes work. Um, what I will spend more time on is, well, I guess we should define one, one other term first. When you have these sp3 orbitals or any of these hybridized orbitals overlapping with each other, that gives you a, a bond. It actually gives us a shape for the bond. Putting together these two hybridized orbitals. So let's say that the purple is from one atom and the red is, is the same type of orbital from another atom. The bond is what you get when these two things overlap. So the bond is actually just gonna be the shape where they kind of all, it's like a Venn diagram. You get the bond where you get both of these orbitals at the same time, because the electrons have to be in, able to be in both functions at the same time for it to be a covalent bond. So what this means is that this, we're going to go one step further. If we can mix together S's and P's to make sp3 orbitals, mixing together two hybridized orbitals to make a bond, we're going to give this its own kind of name as well. We call this a sigma bond. So the Greek lowercase Greek letter sigma. Right? And so basically all of the bonds that we see, all the covalent bonds we see happen because we get these half filled hybridized orbitals that overlap with each other. And we just do the same thing again. We just take them and say, okay, I'm going to take 50% this orbital and 50% that orbital and add them up. And where you get the constructive interference is where you're going to find your electrons. That's going to be the sh new shape of the orbital. Yeah. Good question. So let's say you have two waves and they're going to run into each other. So let's say we have a, a wave going this way and a wave coming this way. What happens when those two waves run into each other? Has anybody ever been in a wave pool before in a water park? There are some spots where you get really big swings, right? We go all the way up and all the way down. And then there's some spots in the wave pool where things kind of cancel out. When these run into each other, when the peaks hit each other, they're gonna add together. And so you wind up with something that is twice as big as it would have been. So we'd be at two times the normal height. If this is y, just making up a number for it, if they're both the same wave, y plus y, when they run into each other, you get constructive interference is when you get both waves working together to make a bigger extreme. 
destructive interference is when you have a peak run into a valley from the one from the other wave and they cancel each other out right so in theory if you go to a wave pool there should be one spot or a few spots that you can sit where your tube will not move up or down if you move sit if you go in between those two spots you'll be get the biggest swing up and down Right, so that's, but that's the, what constructive interference is, is when you get two peaks working together to make something twice as high or twice as low. All right. So why bother defining this as a sigma bond? Well, part of it is just the idea that these functions can mix together and make these new shapes if it's energetically favorable to do so. But part of it also is gonna explain what happens when you have a carbon with a double bond. If you have a carbon with a double bond, how many groups of electrons do you have taking up space around the carbon? It's only three electron groups there, right? So what's the electron geometry of this? Trigonal planar, right? Planar because it's flat. Well, the other thing to think about with this one is if you have a carbon here and an oxygen here, there's the first bond is gonna look like this, right? The two hybridized orbitals overlapping with each other, like I just showed. You can't do that with a second bond though. The space is already taken up. So a double bond has to be two different shapes of bonds. You get this sigma bond, but then basically you also get something that looks kind of like two p orbitals overlapping. If you have to make a second bond between two atoms, you have to have p orbitals to do that. You can't use the hybridized orbitals to do that because they need to be above and below this space. So what happens when you do this, you kind of get this sort of shape that kind of looks like these sort of smearing out or um, above and below the sigma bond. And this whole thing is going to be a different phase than the other one. Well, if you have to use p orbitals to do this, then you didn't get to mix your p orbitals in together to make an sp3. Right? This, we only were able to make an sp3 hybridized orbitals because we had one s orbital and three pieces of a p orbital, right? That's what the sp3 means. One part s to three parts p. If you get something making a double bond, we don't actually get to mix in all three of these p orbital pieces. What happens instead? Well, we leave one of them behind. And so instead of an sp3 carbon, we get an sp, how many pieces of the p orbital do we get to mix in? Only two. And then the other unhybridized p orbital turns into a pi bond. So sigma bonds were the ones that looked like this with the hybridized orbitals. If you take two p orbitals, if you make a second bond between the same two atoms, it has to be a pi bond. So anytime you're going to have an electron geometry that's trigonal planar, that corresponds with basically leaving one of your p orbitals out. If you leave one of your two p orbitals out of the, out of the equation to make it sp2, you don't get a tetrahedral shape anymore. You get a trigonal planar shape. So sp3, means tetrahedral electron geometry. SP2, one part S to two part P, means trigonal planar 
So if we had a triple bond, we would get something, basically we have to take two parts of the P orbitals to make double bonds, right? To make pi bonds this is why we don't call them just double bonds, triple bonds, because a double bond is a sigma bond and a pi bond. They're not the same energy because they don't overlap. They don't have the same shapes. If we have a triple bond, that corresponds to adding another p orbital that has to be perpendicular to this one. And it also can't overlap with the same space as the carbon and oxygen sigma bond. So where would that go? Into the board and out of the board. So if you think about taking, okay, here's my p orbital that was up and down. My p orbital, it's into the board and out of the board is gonna do the same thing around the sigma bond. And now we only have two pieces of a P or one piece of a P orbital mixed together, right? So if you have something that has two pi bonds to it, so the example I was gonna use was not actually a triple bond, it was another double bond going the other direction. So if we look at carbon dioxide, Carbon dioxide has is a carbon in the middle and then a double bond to one oxygen and double bond to the other oxygen, right? Well, it can't be up and down. The other pi bond that's attached to this middle carbon can't be up and down because we already used that p orbital. So it has to go in and out. Instead, we get something that would look kind of like this sort of figure eight shape behind everything into the board and out of the board. And that means this carbon in the middle has two pi bonds, has two p orbitals that are being used already to make these double bonds, which means it only gets one part of a p orbital to use, which So here's a better drawing of what a pi bond looks like. Carbon's unhybridized p orbital mixes with oxygen's unhybridized p orbital. And when they overlap, you can wind up with an extra bond around the sigma bond that's in the middle. Weird, right? Does it make more sense or less sense with the better picture? Less. It's the same thing I drew up here. They're just showing it instead of separate p orbitals and then smearing in the difference. All double bonds are like, all double bonds are a sigma bond because that's how you get the best overlap is between these is right here. <laughs> if you can't have a second bond here, but we still need to fill that carbon's valence, but we run out of electrons, you make a pi bond that goes around the sigma bond. And the one I was actually looking for is, sorry, never mind. I don't have that figure in this, in this one. If you, if you do the same thing the other direction, it's gotta be rotated 90 degrees. So your second pi bond has to be into the board and out of the board. Hybridization, orbital hybridization. Still orbital hybridization. We can talk about the hybridization of individual atoms. And that's what gives you like the sp3 or the sp2. And then when you mix those together, you get these sigma bonds or these pi bonds, right? So it's all the idea that you're gonna take these function shapes and mix them together in a way that's gonna make things lower in energy. So proteins don't usually keep connecting by having more than one pi bond in a row. When they're all sigma bonds, then that's that's what you get when you make a peptide bond between two amino acids. 
is you make a sigma bond between the nitrogen from one molecule and the oxygen from another molecule. And that happens just the same way. By allowing those orbital shapes to overlap with each other, you can make a new bond. You only make a pi bond if you need to make a double bond because you ran out of electrons. I go back to the way we think about Lewis dot structures. You see the double bonds show up when we run out of electrons before all the valences are filled, right? The ideal way of making a Lewis dot structure is you just fill everything in and you run out of electrons, right? When everything has a full valence, right? You only make the pi bonds if you ran out of things, right? And so that's, they're not as favorable as these sigma bonds because they don't overlap as well. So in term, when I keep saying that, when it comes to the, um, the Lewis dot structures, so let's say we were looking at, let's, let's look at CO2. So CO2, darker color, we've got a carbon and an oxygen on e each side. We count up the number of electrons, that's two times six for the oxygens plus one times four electrons for the carbon, right? So 12, that gives me 16 electrons. We start by attaching these and then fill in everything that's left. That's all of the electrons we have to work with. That's 16, right? But carbon doesn't have a full valence yet. So if we left it like this, this oxygen is an sp3 oxygen. It has four clouds of things taking up space around it. But because we need to fill carbon's valence, we're going to force oxygen to share more than it wants to and make it an sp2 carb or oxygen instead of an sp3 oxygen. We forced it to share more than it wants to. And when I say more than it wants to, it doesn't like pi bonds are not inherently very stable because it's better if you can get everything to be sigma bonds because everything overlaps better when you can arrange things pointed and completely opposite from each other, when you can mix in all of the p orbitals together. But if we don't have enough electrons to do that, that's what I mean by running out of electrons. We started making those pi bonds because we didn't have enough electrons to just fill carbon's valence on its own. Right? And so that's when we're going to start seeing things that aren't sp3 all of a sudden they might be sp2 if you have a carbon with one pi bond where one of its orbitals has to stay un unhybridized. A carbon that makes two pi bonds either to the same atom or to opposite atoms has to have two pieces of it that are not hybridized. So instead of an S sp3 was your entire p orbital gets mixed in. SP2 is when you have one p orbital that doesn't get mixed in. SP is when you have two pieces of the p orbital don't get to be mixed together because you have two pi bonds from that carbon in the middle or a triple bond going the other way. If we looked at the example that it has you do in the slides was cyan hydrocyanic acid, which looks like this. Right. If, it's had, if it's got a triple bond between this carbon and this nitrogen, that means you have to have two pi bonds on this carbon, right? You have to have two of the bonds that go, I, I tend to draw these, that they kind of look like, um, like canoes to me, but I've also had classes that called them vampire teeth. Um, those pi bonds kind of, that have that sort of above and below pointed shape. The first pi bond might be up and down. Second pi bond that we need would be into the board and out of the board. So we get this really, really complicated shape um, where I can try and draw it in three dimensions. But as you may have noticed so far, I'm not an artist. So carbon, nitrogen, I'm going to do the sigma bond in black. So that's your strong bond. That's the first bond that you make. 
Then there's going to be a figure eight bond a, that goes into the board and out of the board. That has that sort of canoe vampire teeth shape to it. So that one's going into the board and out of the board. This one's right in the middle. Where's the last one have to go? Up and down. So this one's going to look like this. And they're all kind of, you know, on top of each other. So, it's, which is why it's so hard to draw it freehand. One up and down, one into the board, out of the board, in one bond that looks different than the others. The ones up and down into the board and out of the board are both pi bonds. So that's a pi bond. The purple one's a pi bond. And the sigma bond is the one right in the middle. All right, last concept. So maybe we're not gonna to get to doing for classifying. You know, probably what we'll do, we're gonna do spend more time with the reaction types after Thanksgiving break. So we'll make hybridization will be your last topic that'll be on the midterm. We're not gonna get into classifying reactions or precipitation versus acid base on the midterm. What's that? The lone pairs still take up space and they still, so they're, they count as, so for this one, nitrogen had a lone pair going this way, right? So it would also be an SP Between like potential needle and like what's that one called? Like the um.